our first session, um, which I don't have on here, but I wanted to introduce our first session. It is um, Federal Initiatives Telling the Stories of All Americans. Uh, our first presenter and moderator uh, is Dr. Stephanie Toothman, um, followed by uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Pitty, Dr. Franklin Odo, Dr. Megan Springate, and Dr. Barbara Little. And before I hand it off to our um, first presenter and moderator, I wanted to do a quick um, introduction of Dr. Toothman before I read her bio. I just wanna say that uh, <laughs> um, I am very thrilled to have this particular panel. I love all my sessions, um, but this panel, for those who know me, this is a very, um, this one is very near and dear to me as I wrote my, my dissertation in the first nine months of the last administration, capturing um, the information particular to the AAPI theme study that Dr. Odo will re um, remark on but I got a chance to meet many of these folks, I think all of them, all the presenters today in this session um, during our time during the Obama administration and at, the, at some point in time in the last administration on these works. And I think, Dr. Toothman, correct me if I'm wrong, I think this is the first time the theme studies have actually talked, will talk to each other in a way. Um, we've all talked to each other in, you know, on conference rooms. I don't think we've talked to each other in conference or Zoom settings. Um, so it's a thrill of mine to bring all of these wonderful people here today for this session. And so without further ado, um, Dr. To uh, Dr. Toothman is retired as Associate Director of Cultural Resources Partnerships and Science at the National Park Service. She retired in 2017 after a 40 year career. Um, you may have known her as the keeper of the National uh, Register of Historic Places. I think that is the coolest title to have. Um, she currently serves in a special appointment as special assistant to the National Park Service Associate Director. In addition, she serves on the boards of the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation and Historic Seattle. During her career in the Pacific West and National Park Service headquarters, she led efforts to tell all American stories through the parks and programs in the National Park Service including sponsoring national theme studies about American Latinos, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and the LGBTQ communities, promoted research and documentation on women's history, including the commemoration of the 19th Amendment, and prepared proposals that led to congressional appropriations to support underrepresented communities in documenting and preserving their stories and cultural resources. So without further ado, I'd like to hand this off to Dr. Stephanie Toothman. Thank you. And I will stop sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, thank you. And um, I have to admit, I'm a little technically challenged at times. Can you hear me? Yes. You can okay. Thank you. So I have the help of Kristen Tepper and I've got three different appliances going here, and I'm hoping I can track them all and be coherent. But thank you for that introduction. It's really an honor to, for me to participate in this conference, which features the work of so many colleagues who partnered with the NPS in our effort to tell all American stories. In addition to Michelle, I'd like to acknowledge Anthea Hartig, Gail Dubrow, Ray Rast, and Tony Castaneda, and Luis Hoyos, all of who in addition to our panelists today, made significant contributions to the NPS effort. Uh, today, I'll be providing an overview of NPS efforts since the early years of the Obama administration to address this important goal. And I'll be followed by Dr. Pitty, who will be discussing, as Michelle mentioned, American Latinos in the Making of America theme study, then Franklin Odo, who led the Asian American and Pacific Islanders theme study, Dr. Megan Springgate, who managed to the complex task of bringing the LGBTQ theme study to reality. And finally, Barbara Little, who continues to lead a robust effort in supporting park and partners of bringing the stories of American communities through uh, and sharing them through NPS social media. Dr. Pitty is Professor of History, American Studies and Ethnicity, Race and Migration at Yale University, where he's founding director of the Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity and Transnational Migration, 
a past member of the National Park Service Advisory Board. He was chair of the National Historic Landmarks Committee, and he has written on topics of Latinx history for the federal courts, for the popular press, and for academic audiences. Dr. Odo is a Japanese American activist and historian. His academic training was in traditional Asian studies, but was in the movement but within the movement that created Asian American and other ethnic studies in the late 1960s as part of the anti-imperialist and anti-racism movements. He has taught at many institutions and is now at Amherst College. In 1997, he became founding director of the Smithsonian's Asian Pacific American program. Megan Springgate, Dr. Springgate is a historical archeologist she not only edited the LGBTQ America's theme study, but she did a fantastic job in serving as the national coordinator for the NPS 19th Amendment Centennial Commemoration. She received her PhD from the University of Maryland in 2017. Dr. Little is the program manager for the Cultural Resources Office of Interpretation and Education for the NPS. The mission of the office is to collaborate to tell all American stories and to, to promote cultural resources, workforce development through youth program internships. She also serves as the program director for the National Park Service's Mellon Humanities Fellows Program and as an adjunct professor in the Department of Anthropology and a, an affiliate for the Center of Heritage Resource Studies at the University of Maryland. So, an, a very um, impressive group of panelists, and I very much appreciate their participation in today's panels. So, I'm going to do my best to keep us all on track here, including our um, time limit. So, my uh, presentation today is, is intended to provide an overview of the strategy and partnerships that shaped NPS actions during the Obama administration and continue today to address the challenge of telling all American stories through the parks and programs the NPS supports. This strategy built upon the efforts of previous research, congressional mandates, the leadership particularly of Director Robert Stanton and many NPS professionals and partners. Despite these efforts, many American communities, their cultures and the resources they value remain significantly underrepresented in our national parks and in programs such as the National Register of Historic Places and the National Historic Landmark Program. The Cultural Resource Challenge, a strategy adopted by the NPS as the anniversaries of the NPS and the NHPA approached, identified five goals to focus our efforts. Um, do I need someone else to change this now? Yeah, just tell, tell her to change. Yeah, please, next slide, please. The National Park Service has often been called America's storyteller in recognition of the many sites we manage as part of the national park system, sites that represent many of our nationally significant stories. NPS also has a responsibility under the National Historic Preservation Act for supporting hundreds of partners who work to preserve, preserve the stories and resources associated with our complex and diverse shared heritage. The National Park System Advisory Board and the National and its National Historic Landmark Committee, formerly chaired by Dr. Pitty, and the National Park Foundation have been two major partners in our effort to implement goal three connecting all Americans to their heritage. There are a number of key actions that, next slide please. We identified a number of key actions for goal three in working to address this challenge. And also we had to address a number of questions. What are the gaps in the stories that are now told in our parks or represented through the National Register or landmark programs? How do we learn about these stories? Whose voice should tell these stories? What are the obstacles to documenting and expanding the narratives of individual parks, thematically linked parks, communities currently underrepresented in the National Register or landmark programs? And what are the tools we have available to support the effort to create a more inclusive and complete national narrative supported by the National Historic Preservation Program 
and its partners. As I said, our overall strategy was defined by a number of actions as we committed to move forward with goal three. Um, the main issue that we wanted to address was, next slide please, was this issue of underrepresentation of many communities. Our best guess in 2010, which was based on the professional experience of senior staff as the National Register was not digitized at the time, was that eight to 10% of the listings of the more than 900,000 listings in the National Register represented American Latinos, Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, Native Americans, African Americans, and women combined. In addition, we knew that there were significant gaps in the representation of these groups in the National Park Service, particularly in terms of modern history, last half of the 19th and 20th century. The Second Century Commission, which was formed to provide a path uh, roadmap for the National Park Service in its second century, identified changing demographics and underrepresentation of minority communities in NPS parks and programs as one of the major issues confronting the Park Service in the second century. Um, next slide, please. Some of the obstacles for addressing underrepresentation included insufficient funding for park research, development of inter interpretation and education programs, as well as training to, on how to deliver these new stories, some of which are very difficult. In addition, insufficient funding for state and tribal survey and nomination programs from the Historic Preservation Fund resulted in very limited new survey and as well insufficient funding for the National Historic Landmark Program uh, restricted our ability to fund new um, theme studies. But that was also um, shaped as far as the NHL program and the fact that th no priorities were made for actually using available funding to address this issue when we put together this goal. Finally, another obstacle um, which we tend to think everybody knows about the National Park Service and all these programs, but there was a profound lack of awareness among many of the communities we wanted to reach, both of the, of, of the federal, state, and local preservation programs and why they might be of help to them, as well as a reluctance to be involved with federal agency. The first time I met with the Cesar Chavez Foundation, the question that they uh, left with us is why in the hell would we want to be involved with the federal government and the National Park Service. So we had uh, a, a big um, thing to change. Oh my gosh, it's already the second morning. So obstacles to addressing underrepresentation, insufficient funding. Oh, oh, next slide, please. So some of the strategies that we used was to provide, prioritize available funding, to commit to fully engaging with community representatives, again, to identify barriers and to seek partners in committed leadership. Next slide, please. Why focus on the theme studies, national recognition through designation by the Secretary of the Interior. The theme studies provide a context for future designations and national register nominations. They also provide a pathway for future recognition through designation as a unit of the national park system. They carry no federal ownership or restrictions and they provide a higher level of protection from adverse federal actions. Next slide, please. The theme study, uh, we felt that by absorbing the theme study costs, we could make a major contribution. Um, the process requires professional support and endurance, and the criteria itself requires demonstration of the highest level of significance. Finally, the application of the integrity criteria places a high value on architectural integrity, which was a challenge for many of the properties we were looking at. Next slide, please. Um, another aspect of this effort was acknowledgement in environmental justice. And with the help of grants from the Kellogg Foundation, we provided funding, who provided funding, we explored the power of acknowledgement through the NHL program as a first step in racial healing, as well as, in, as providing a pathway for a seat at the table through section 106 for dealing with threats to these resources and 
the whole issue of environmental justice. Next slide, please. I'm going to quickly go through, uh, next slide, please, some of the spin-offs from the theme studies. Next slide, please. Women's history, next slide, please. And the LGBT theme study, and next slide, please. And some of the accomplishments for new NHL theme studies, 97 new NHLs, which almost 50% addressed underrepresented groups, 13 new park units, increased collaboration within the Park Service, as well as with multiple partners to carry out this effort, and a major expansion of National Park Service social media coverage. Next slide, please. As well as uh, increased congressional support, the underrepresented community grants, the Reinstitute HPC, High Circus Black College grants, the recent expansion of the civil rights grants beyond the African American experience to other communities, and the grants all provided, uh, helped fill the gaps of funding that we've needed to both implement the initial actions and continue to carry it on. Final slide, please. Keeping up the momentum. Uh, the NHL guidance that the uh, National Landmark Committee, <laughs> with a lot of support from Dr. Pitty, uh, to update um, the guidance for NHLs provides alternative routes for applying the criteria that reduces barriers for architectural significance. I mentioned the increased funding, the ongoing research at, with, by multiple partners that have stim been stimulated by these initiatives, Within the Park Service, the Arc to Equality Discussion Group has continues to provide a forum to support diversity, equity, and inclusion within the service. And then most importantly, in my opinion, is the stimulus that this has given to the growth of new heritage organizations within these communities to support the preservation of the resources that they value. Thank you. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Stephen. Thank you so much, Stephanie. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen as well. Um, good afternoon, everybody. It's really an honor to be here. And um, big thanks to Michelle and to the organizers for the invitation to join you all. Um, I'm Stephen Pitty, as, um, as Stephanie said. Professor of History and Founding Director of the um, Center for the Study of Race, Indigeneity, and Transnational Migration in, in New Haven, Connecticut at Yale, a historic home of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pagasid, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin-speaking peoples, uh, where colonial and contemporary violence and creative survival and persistence is certainly visible every day, as is the ongoing history of Latinos uh, in New Haven and in Connecticut. And so it's my privilege today to, uh, to talk about the time in which I served on the American Latino Scholars Expert Panel um, for a number of years, um, at a time in which I was also chairing, as Stephanie said, the NHL Committee and working as a member of the National Park Service Advisory Board. I wanna say, first of all, that so much progress was made um, during that time, in large part, thanks to Stephanie and her leadership and thanks as well to Director Jarvis and to Secretaries Ken Salazar and Sally Jewell. And so at so, to, at, to some extent, I think one of the takeaways that I have from this entire process is the importance, not only of the kind of funding that um, Stephanie underlined and underscored in her presentation, but also the importance of leadership at all levels, including within the National Park Service. Um, so today I'm gonna speak briefly about the American Latino Heritage Initiative and its related theme study. Um, this, like so much else, was, of course, a group effort drawing from and channeling um, first and foremost place-based preservationist work driven by many Latinx communities throughout the United States, states work that stretches back many decades. Uh, and secondly, drawing from scholarly and not necessarily place-based work and research by Latinx researchers and others who've described and cataloged and contextualized who've interpreted and debated these important histories for over a hundred years. Um, so uh, this really was a group effort because of the willingness and the enthusiasm of NPS professionals um, to grapple with these topics, 
uh, and to better represent and engage with these communities and these histories. So while I played a role, much of what I'm gonna be describing could be narrated by many, many others. The Latino Scholars Panel was organized in 2011. Thanks, I think most immediately to Secretary Ken Salazar's frustration with the minimal and even embarrassing nature of Latino historical interpretation by NPS up until roughly that time. So our group was convened under the auspices of uh, the NPS advisory board, which in these years was itself a very, very strong board. And here I've listed for you um, our 11 panel members who you can see um, represent a variety of backgrounds, institutions, and areas of expertise. Uh, we were also, I will also say that we drew during the time of our work um, from the expertise within the National Park Service. Um, and as we crafted the theme study, we did consult with people in NPS like David Vela, uh, director of the Southeast Regional Office, like Joseph Sanchez, superintendent of Petroglyph National Monument, and like Dennis Vasquez, superintendent of Guadalupe Mountains National Park, all of whom were quite helpful. But I do think it's fair to say that expertise within NPS uh, leadership um, on questions of Latino history was not particularly wide or deep uh, in the early 2010s when our panel was convened. When we started, uh, the Park Service had roughly 2,400 NHLs, only three of which I think had a strong connection to Latino history in the 20th century. I'm thinking here of Ybor City's historic district in Tampa, of the Freedom Tower in Miami, and of the 40 Acres site in California. So our, um, uh, our panel, by my reckoning, had at least three key aims. First of all, in pursuing Latino history, we, want, we wanted to emphasize this history since 1820, since the NPS had done considerable work uh, on earlier periods, particularly around Spanish colonial sites, for example, missions. Uh, Catholic missions. Secondly, we wanted to be sure to cover a broad geography uh, and not confining ourselves, say, to only California or only Texas. And thirdly, I think in our work, we did want to present um, a credible state of the field um, that did capture um, the best thinking and the best research that was being published in this field uh, around the country. So we were charged with uh, crafting a theme study. Uh, and in, uh, in that charge, uh, we were <laughs> asked by Secretary Salazar and others to work very, very quickly. And had I think it not been for his leadership and his example, uh, many of us might have turned away at that uh, at point. Uh, the timeline that was established for us was ambitious, if not impossible. We had roughly 12 months uh, to name topics for separate essays, find and work with authors who would be commissioned, edit those essays, and then send them along for publication. So there were, many, there were many other challenges as well beyond the timeline. Our group as a group ha had no past history of working together with one, of, with one another. A few of us uh, did um, have some familiarity with one another's work or had met each other on occasion, but we were mostly strangers uh, as a group and none of us had ever worked on a theme study. We had different areas of expertise uh, and different priorities, of course. We were all busy with full-time jobs, even more than full-time jobs. We had great co-chairs uh, in Belinda Faustinos and in Luis Hoyos, uh, but the project required significant coordination and uh, sustained group work. So over the course of months, uh, we met frequently and we had many uh, pre-Zoom conference calls. You remember the time when we used to do this kind of thing just over the phone? Uh, at the organizational stage, I think we felt that we had at least three interrelated jobs. First, we wanted to identify essay topics. Second, we knew that we needed to identify themes that would connect those essays to one another and make them seem understandable um, in what would become sections of the theme study or the book. And third and relatedly, of course, we needed to identify and invite the authors who would do the work of putting uh, these essays together. Now, the final theme study that was produced by 2012 uh, emphasized the four themes you see here um, on the screen. And each of these four themes, in turn, had four essays for a grand total of 16 thematic essays, each of which was roughly 5,000 words. Uh, these four themes, as you see, were making the nation, making a life, making a living, and making a democracy. As a panel, uh, we debated these a great deal, whether these made the most sense. 
uh, again, under um, difficult, uh, difficult timeline. And I think it's fair to say in retrospect that our 11 panel members were never entirely unanimous about whether this, this was the best rubric, uh, whether we might have done this uh, in a different or even better way. But let me talk in the time that remains quickly about each of these uh, and then conclude with a quick reflection. Uh, Making the Nation um, included, uh, like all of these sections, four essays written by top scholars at, uh, who were leaders in their field and tried to cover everything from the transition from the colonial period to the national period of the 19th century uh, through contemporary immigration, through media, uh, and through intellectual traditions. The second section, Making a Life, um, focused on topics such as um, religiosity, the arts, sports, uh, and food. The third section on Making a Living included an account of Latino labor history, of businesses and entrepreneurship, of science and medicine, and of Latinos in the military. Uh, and the section on Making a Democracy, the final section, uh, was really a section about U.S. participation in politics, the quest for political inclusion, really about electoral rights, Latinos and the law, efforts at civil rights attainment through legal strategies, uh, a, a, a great essay on educational access and schooling, and finally an essay about U.S. foreign policy and contemporary immigration. Um, I, uh, I authored the core essay for this volume, which was one of the, one of the kind of introductory pieces of the volume, uh, entitled um, American Latinos and the Making of the United States, which tried to provide an overview of Latino history in roughly five or 6,000 words in a way that would be slightly less um, academic than most of our essays and approachable because it focused, it provided this overview through snapshots of five historical figures listed here, a Cuban, a Cuban priest, a Mexican-American writer, a Black Puerto Rican historian, a Guatemalan labor activist, and a prominent Mexican-American congressperson from California, who I hoped would get us from roughly the late 18th century into the early 21st century. In addition, the theme study included an introductory essay uh, by two of our panel members, and I think a very significant bibliography that tried to capture important uh, uh, readings that those interested in following up on these essays could, uh, could, could go to um, as they were seeking to learn more about these topics or go into areas that our theme study um, had not uh, been able to cover in any depth. Uh, the takeaways, I think, for me um, about the theme studies is that, you know, this, this was an incredibly exciting pro process that only happened because of leadership from Stephanie and, and John Jarvis and, and, and Secretary Salazar and Secretary Jewell and others, as I, as I said. But it was a tough process on everyone, staff, uh, panelists, authors. Uh, and one of our commissioned essays actually didn't make it into the volume because of the tight timeline. We were able to produce new and original contributions, really exciting essays that I think have been of use to people. And, uh, and this pushed our authors to do work that they had never done before. For example, a specialist in Mexican-American business history had to learn about Puerto Rican business history in order to write uh, their essay. I think it was important that we focused here on the, uh, the post-1820 period and that there was a strong focus on the 20th century in particular, which I think is quite valuable um, for NPS and for others. Uh, this was a process, of course, that was expensive. It was expensive in terms of time and uh, financial support, as Stephanie mentioned, and that, that needs to be reckoned with and appreciated, I think, in retrospect. I hope and I think that the initiative and the theme study provided some credibility um, to Latino history as, a, uh, as an important field with deep roots, um, with real scholarship behind it, and that the essays provide, may provide some thematic orientation for people, for practitioners and others working in the field, as well as resources um, for um, you know, doing convincing work in their own ways in local, regional, and national settings. For me, the key shortcoming here is that you know, our authors that we commissioned were largely university-based academics who were themselves not practitioners in preservationist work. And so the essays tend to be quite light on naming specific sites and places. Uh, it's, there's less specificity, specificity in, in this theme study about place-based histories. And that was in part a result of the timeline that people were working so fast and in part because of our area's expertise. Uh, this did though, as Stephanie said, lead to help to lead to designations. And there is much, much more to do um, that could be work that can be done using this theme studies.
this theme study. In my mind, the themes, we're very proud of the theme study. Uh, eight years later, it remains, I think, one of the most important federal documents ever published related to uh, Latino, Latinx histories, but it already deserves updating. One could very productively, I think, go back into it and add additional essays uh, or uh, edit uh, and expand upon the existing essays. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Right on time. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Franklin, you're up. Thank you. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> am I all right? Can you hear? All right. So I want to, Stephen did such a great job. I think uh, I will um, <clears throat> do, approach this in a, in a very different kind of way. The, Asian American Pacific Islander theme study uh, went through some of the same um, issues and, and uh, problems and resolutions that the Latinx one did. <clears throat> if you would like more specific information about the theme study itself, um, I would refer you to uh, Michelle McGowan's uh, dissertation um, and also to the copy online. So, um, with your permission, or or not, <laughs> I want to do this in a in a in a much more personal kind of way, and and partly because I I I think it's useful to trace how um, these efforts get to be um, addressed in ways that are not necessarily just institutional, and um, partly also because. Asian Americans are uh, subject to a very lethal um, model minority myth that celebrates um, Asian Americans as a particularly a successful um, people of color minority group, and 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 um, only rarely uh, <clears throat> acknowledges the the uh, injustices and pains that come along with some of these allegations of success or adjacent to whiteness. So <clears throat> let me start by uh, saying that place was always important to those of us who were involved in <clears throat> beginning ethnic studies or Asian American studies in particular in the late 60s. Um, we thought about places like, places like Angel Island, for example, in uh, San Francisco Bay, which is often compared to um, Ellis Island, um, on, on the East Coast as places of uh, immigration and in-migration. But, but Angel Island, uh, it should be noted, was established in 1910. And it was primarily a place to catch um, folks who were coming in as a result of, the, of uh, defying or circumventing the uh, Exclusion Acts that began in 1875 with the Page Act. Uh, and then 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, and then subsequently with um, exclusion acts that uh, basically targeted the Asian and Pacific Triangle. And the uh, second large group, I think, of um, <clears throat> places that were that we noted almost immediately were the um, incarceration sites that were used to uh, detain. Uh, Japanese American incarcerees, uh, victims of forced, unjust, unconstitutional, uh, forced relocation uh, during World War II. So um, I, I guess I'd start by saying that um, I'll be 82 in May of this year. So that gives me a little bit of leeway maybe to think back about some of the limits of assimilation and you know, talk a little bit about the, the prob problematics of even um, what looked like apparently successful, relatively successful acculturation and assimilation in, into American society and why place can help to clarify um, what, what those costs might be. Um, so let me start by saying I was born and reared in Hawaii, which was then a territory in 1939. So as a young boy of color, growing up in a majority minority 
uh, Hawaii. Um, by the way, it's, it's still the only state in the union which has never had a white majority. But it's very important to indicate that this, like uh, Indian reservations, I think, or ghettos in inner cities, um, these, are not, these are places where um, white dominance, white, white supremacy is never far from our thoughts. Um, in government, media, high culture, education, perhaps not in K-12 K sports. Those were the only places I think I recall, uh, even in places, even in a place where Asian American and Pacific Islanders were about two thirds of the population. That's the only place that I can, I can think of where we were uh, not uh, deemed to be marginal. So I was not a particularly good student in high school. And the high school itself was uh, mediocre, I think. Um, so I graduated in the class of 1957 from Kamiki High School um, with over 400 students uh, in, in, in that particular class. I was a starting outfielder on the varsity baseball team. Um, good field, no hit. So uh, couldn't get very far <laughs> with that. Uh, but I even played football for a couple of years. Uh, I was bigger then. <laughs> no. Uh, but I was a student leader, a student body president when I graduated. But I think uh, sort of like ghetto kids, um, I had street smarts. And um, I was a first generation college student. Uh, and I assumed I, was be go I would be going to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, the local university. But, but on a whim, I applied to Harvard and Princeton as well. I was accepted by both and enrolled at Princeton um, with a full ride. And I think the interview was the uh, deciding factor in that. And there again, I attribute that to street smarts rather than to academic excellence. I wanna say at this point that <clears throat> as far as I can remember, I always wished that I had been born white. And I rationalized it at the time as not psychological or emotional or deficit, um, a deficit ridden uh, anxiety disorder. I thought it was a purely pragmatic realization that only white males had full options available in life. So some of the ways in which I had gotten this was place. So in, in majority minority Hawaii, historic places and people they acknowledged were all white including major street names. One, one example, the, the rural street that I grew up on was Kamiloiki, Hawaiian name, but no one I knew at the time uh, knew what it meant or was particularly concerned about. Um, but the main streets in Honolulu itself were names like Fort or Bishop or King. Um, <clears throat> my introduction indicates the NHL sites in Hawaii itself, so you can refer to that. Um, so the only thing I would say about that is, if you if you think of looking at the history of the Hawaiian ar archipelago through the NHL sites, which numbered about 33, you'd go from um, prehistoric archeological sites um, of the indigenous people to 1941 and Pearl Harbor. And you know nothing at all about what happens to indigenous people or uh, Asian settler immigrants in that period or after 1945 for that matter. So as I said, I get to Princeton entering the class of 1961 with about 720 classmates, all male, uh, in a university known to be uh, particularly friendly to Southern boys. In fact, uh, the um, anecdotal history was that pre-antebellum uh, Southerners brought their slaves uh, to Princeton to take care of them while they were going, going through college. So I, in the class of 61, I believe I was about uh, one of perhaps half a dozen students of color. Um, like the other Ivies, especially pre-affirmative action, 
there was a highly selective and highly stratified society within its walls. Um, in Princeton's case, the, the social order, pecking order, was generally defined by its 17 eating clubs with all uh, basically, all 17 of them basically distinguishable in social standing from one to 17. And we could sort of distinguish uh, the, the social hierarchy from there. So junior and senior years were dictated by where one took meals, socialized, schmoozed, partied, and made um, networks. So too few, there were too few students of color to matter. So I don't think there was any particular concern about um, discrimination about uh, regarding students of color. But there was a lot of anti-Semitic taint to all of this. In fact, in my year, um, anti-Semitism uh, issue exploded and Princeton was forced to embark upon an administratively uh, mandated uh, um, implementation of eating facilities for those students who were not who had not chosen to go to uh, these eating clubs or who were not uh, invited to join any of them. So long story short, <clears throat> I had spent the first two years immersed in understanding and manipulating this new universe and did at least superficially fairly well. So in the eating club system, one did not apply to them. The selection was based on interview visits from existing club members in a process called Bicker, uh, where all sophomores during the spring break stayed in their rooms and the uh, eating club members visited and interviewed them. The top eating club was called Ivy Club and, and oldest and most prestigious of the lot. Ivy's memberships included um, <clears throat> students from families like the Rockefellers and Mellons and Pells. It was small, it was elite, uh, indeed, an earlier student newspaper headline noted that uh, in that particular year, Ivy only invited 11 sophomores, uh, and the headline blared, even Christ took more. So, in, in, uh, so I was invited to join Ivy, which was an extraordinary kind of event and coup. Um, for a working class kid from the territory of Hawaii, there seemed to be nowhere else to go. And in a way it actually liberated me, at least partially, from the need to prove myself acceptable to elite white society. I was there. Um, I was still ignorant of many other barriers I had, which I had to confront, but that one um, incident changed my life in retrospect. Another one that I, I want to mention briefly. I do have to give you two minutes. Okay. Thank you. Between sophomore and junior years, I went to Italy in 1959 to live with a family in Ascoli Piceno, close to the Adriatic. I was part of a group of 10 students there. I told you I was a mediocre student. My experience with high school Latin was disastrous. But I discovered in Italy that with time on task and, and some study, that I actually could learn a foreign language. So within a few weeks, I was able to converse um, in Italian. Um, one day our group got together with the host family members and I found myself the lone student with a few of the men. The men were discussing their participation in World War II. Recall that this was 1959, only 14 years after the end of the war. And I was astonished to discover there's still warm feelings about Mussolini. and. Um, much later reflected on why they were comfortable discussing this adulation to a young American. Didn't they know that we might not be comfortable with that? Well, my conclusion then and now was that I was not really considered an American, but a Japanese. And Japan in World War II, remember, had been part of the Axis along with Germany and, Ta and Italy. So that discussion was for them entirely kosher. For me, it was the first time in my young, ambitious life that not being white, that being part of a mar marginalized minority, even one who had been anointed to, to join the most elite of Princeton social groups, 
could gain really important, really valuable uh, uh, perspectives that were routinely denied to white Americans. So I don't know if that prepared me to live a life that was different, but I think it, it, it made a big difference. And I, what I submit to you all today is that not all youth of color might share the angst that I felt or paths that I chose, but that all too many continue to be so impacted. Historic preservation, uh, naming historic houses, sites, parks, is only one small part of the struggle to provide a more just and equitable society. But this is a worthwhile journey, so I congratulate all my peers for participating. Thank you. Franklin, thank you, and I hope you're writing your memoirs. <laughs> So we can learn more. That was fascinating. Thank you so much. Sure. I'm going to turn it over to Megan right now. So um, go for it, Megan. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to um, share my screen. I think that's, I think I have shared my screen. Um, the multiple models, strange things. Um, so it is so good to be in the same room with everyone. Um, it's, it's been a long time. Um, and yet we keep, we keep working together in situations like this or via email or all these different ways. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the LGBTQ theme study. I wanted to start, um, uh, with a definition of this idea of expansive versus inclusive preservation. And I wish I could remember where I first heard this distinction. Um, I think it, yeah, I wish I could remember um, because I think it's an important conversation. So inclusive preservation um, suggests that there is a gatekeeper for um, deciding who gets to be included in any particular history or preservation. And um, expansive preservation, um, you lose, you, the, eliminates that idea of a gatekeeper, right? It, it eliminates the idea of somebody in power deciding who gets to be included, right? Um, and I think uh, a lot of that, the, the difference, right, comes from listening to communities, letting us know what is important to them instead of us telling them what is important to them slash us, right? So it's a, it's a different emphasis on the direction of um, determining importance. And um, for the theme study, uh, we sort of, took a lot from the community. Um, originally sort of walking into the scholars panel uh, to talk about shaping the LGBTQ theme study, we had 20 panelists, historians, geographers, community activists, educators, archeologists, um, all came together to talk about, you know, what this thing was gonna look like. And we had sort of initially envisioned a chronological um, approach because, Historians love a chronology. Um, and so we had thought about, you know, uh, pre-Stonewall, Stonewall to HIV, HIV to activism, and then post-activism. And um, that lasted all of about five minutes in that roundtable meeting, um, which I think means we had a lot of the right people in the room, um, because that is a very white, male, urban, middle-class LGBTQ history, right? It's that, and that's the, the history that um, the public thinks about when they think about LGBTQ history. And that's the sort of the image that you see on the screen um, is, is very white. It's about military service. It's about marriage. Um, and uh, so, it was like, as soon as that, they said that in the meeting, it was like, oh my God, like they're absolutely right. And we need to um, change direction. And I, I actually want to um, 
give a shout out to the National Park Foundation and to the Gill Foundation who funded the LGBTQ theme study. Um, so it was a little bit different than the other theme studies that the Park Service has done. Uh, but so, so just a shout out to them before I forget. Um, so clearly this, this history, this white middle-class male, you know, it's all about gay marriage, um, urban, that kind of thing is, is absolutely part of LGBTQ history, but it is not the LGBTQ history. And LGBTQ historians have been telling a much broader story for decades. Um, but for whatever reason, that history has not made it into sort of the national consciousness of, of what LGBTQ history is, right? So this, what you see on the screen is what people think about as LGBTQ history. Um, these are the kinds of histories that were included in the theme study um, because every author was chosen for their expertise and they were not censored in what they included, right? Um, the, the, they, were they were allowed to have a voice about their perspective on LGBTQ history. Um, they weren't, there was no sort of, or very little sort of respectability politics in terms of what could be included. And so what we, we got was histories that included um, things that you don't normally hear about in a, a sort of public history narrative, including sex workers, um, the leather community, drag performers, um, and other um, aspects of LGBTQ community um, that are not sort of in that, that realm of kind of respectability politics that, that shaped the sort of national discussion around LGBTQ marriage and service in the military, right? Which is like, no, no, we're all just like everybody else and therefore we should have the same rights, right? So it was a, a, a different sort of um, take. Um, the LGBTQ theme study was very different from other Park Service theme studies uh, for an, in a number of different ways. Um, we were funded, as I mentioned, we were funded uh, externally, not through any kind of congressional um, allocation or internal allocation of um, Park Service money. Um, the direction and contents were community driven, right? So. We went from this idea of a very chronological theme study of like, oh, it'll probably be like a couple of hundred pages um, to this thematic theme study that um, uh, actually breaks 1200 pages uh, in extent, which is, which is why there is no hard copy published version available. It's just like too huge. Um, deliberately intersectional, right? So we have a number of chapters, every author, had to be place-based, right? Which, which for the geographers required no uh, conversation, but for the historians, some of the academic historians needed to like have a tutorial on what that actually meant, right? Um, it, but, it, but also they had to include not just a white middle-class urban history. They had to talk about other populations, et cetera. But we also have chapters on, for example, Asian American, African American, um, bisexual, transgender. Uh, we picked up the chapter from the Latino theme study that didn't make it in, which was the chapter on, on Latino uh, gender and sexuality. And because each of those communities has a different history and you can't understand being um, Black and gay in the United States without understanding how being Black shapes somebody's identity as well as being LGBTQ. So we needed to give a bigger context um, for that intersectionality, inclu intersectional inclusion in the other chapters. Um, we wrote for many publics and we specifically uh, targeted multiple publics uh, with the theme study by um, my colleague, Katie Crawford Lackey, uh, spearheaded putting together the Pride Guide, which is a way for uh, community members to engage with the content of the theme study and connect their personal experiences and ideas to some of the larger themes. So you don't need to be queer to 
um, get at something from the pride guide because it talks about things like what's important to preserve how do you experience a place what are the places that are um, important to you what are what kinds of things make community um, you know have you ever um, had to take a stand about something so it it frames this discussion about LGBTQ history in terms of these themes that are kind of more universal and that anybody can connect with right it's a um, it's still not a tiny document. Uh, it's 72 pages, but it's certainly a smaller uh, lift. Um, so I wanna just, this is just a summary of the effects of the theme study. And um, when we started, we knew only of about four or five LGBTQ places um, in the National Register and that were National Historic Landmarks. Um, since the uh, National Register nominations have become full text searchable because they are on the National Archives website, um, it turns out that there are actually a bunch of uh, National Register nominations that do include LGBTQ history. They're not nominated for LGBTQ history, but they include LGBTQ history ranging from passing reference to a, a gay community group that met in a church basement to, you know, a page and a half of why YMCAs are um, like physically architecturally designed in, in the ways that they are. Um, it's, it's actually, it's fascinating to, to, to read these. Um, but since that time, we've got a whole bunch of, of new um, National Historic Landmark listings, National Register of Historic Places listings. A lot of these are intersectional sites, right? So um, the Japanese YWCA is both an Asian American and an LGBTQ um, site for a, an early meeting of gay rights activists, but also Bayard Rustin um, taught a course there. Bayard Rustin's home in New York City, uh, Alice Austin House for photography and also her, her gender. Um, I, do wanna, um, I do wanna point out um, the, the variety of places that are represented here. So we've got Kentucky, Colorado, DC, New York, Oregon, Puerto Rico, um, and Club Darcel 15th is actually a drag club in Portland um, that's been listed. That's very exciting. Uh, there are still um, several places that are on the National Register and National Historic Landmarks that do not, that have LGBTQ history, but don't talk about it in the nomination, which is an opportunity to do amendments, should anybody be so inclined. Um, I do wanna point out the upper right corner, that's the Rower um, Relocation Center where George Takei and his family were interned uh, during World War II. We've also seen, and I'm watching the clock, I see that my time is running out, but. We've also got state level theme studies and I know this list is not complete. Um, uh, and I take that as a success of the LGBTQ theme study that there is so much going on that it is almost impossible anymore to keep track. Um, but we've seen state level theme studies, city level theme studies. There's an historic American building survey of, um, of night, nightclubs in DC focused predominantly on African American uh, clubs. Um, and then, you know, in the larger sense, although the theme study was written with the thought of um, National Register and National Historic Landmarks nominations, um, it's been used in other ways to recognize places in other ways, including state and city historic markers. The one at the, the crossroads is in Dallas, Texas. We've got street names and parks and facilities like the Harvey Milk Terminal in San Francisco. Um, all these different ways that people can mark and share their community history that go beyond the National Register and National Historic Landmarks um, programs, right? Um, we talk about First Nations folks in the theme study and uh, I, I urge people to read that chapter when um, considering it because they just do not um, recognize uh, LGBTQ in this in the sense of um, gender and sexual preference that that um, Western folks think about it, um, and then I've and then really quickly I, I just I'm I'm getting told to stop talking, which is totally good. But 
to, to think about what makes LGBTQ history, right? It, and, and I've actually been asked this several times. Um, it's not, we don't think about women's history only because they were women and they did something womanly or Asian American history as an Asian American person fighting for Asian American rights. So LGBTQ history is about LGBTQ people who do anything else, right? Um, suffrage, all these folks had were women who had relationships with other women often for decades. Uh, Dr. Polly Murray is a legal, an amazing legal mind and, and pioneer um, who struck, suffered her whole life or struggled her whole life with her gender and sexuality. Um, Dr. Alan Hart was one of the first trans uh, folks in the country. And um, he, I, he invented a way of identifying tuberculosis through x-rays and, and because he was able to, using that method, you're able to identify um, infection with tuberculosis and treat it faster than if you just wait for symptoms. Um, he has saved thousands of lives and it is still a method that we use today. So that's a very quick overview. Um, and I think just as a last thought, um, one of the best outcomes has been to be seen, to exist, to um, have to see that Amer that LGBTQ history is American history and is part of this great messy mess uh, that makes up um, makes up the United States and its history and its past and, and also moving forward its future. So thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to say some words. Thank you, Megan. Um, thank you for the uh, information you shared on the National Register now being searchable and digitized. Yes, I mean, that's a big step forward. And um, I'll just comment quickly. I think this was the, one, the theme study that we wondered what kind of pushback we'd get politically. And surprisingly, I can only remember one phone call um, from that. So, you know, a I handful. There was like a very, a very small handful of of the standard. Like, why are you spending taxpayer dollars on this thing? Right, the same kind of. Right, and we could say, uh, actually, we're not. <laughs> so well, also that, but it's the same time. Anytime you like do anything that's outside of somebody's what they think your lane should be, so exactly. it wasn't. It was not at all a substantial pushback. So I'll turn it over to Barbara. We'll have more time to discuss because um, these are such short intros to such wonderful yeah. complex topics. So Barbara, take it away. Yeah. Hi, I'm just going to say hi and I'm going to turn my video off because I'm the connection's a little shaky. And then I will share my screen. Um, my entire screen. Okay. Is that working? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks. I'm so glad to be part of this. I'm so glad to be back in touch with you all. I really enjoyed listening. Um, and I'm really grateful for everybody's work. Um, it really is pretty phenomenal to put it all together. Um, so I want to say a little bit about our approach to telling all American stories, because I think that phrase really acknowledges the federal responsibility to serve all constituents. Uh, as you've heard already, during the Obama administration, the Department of Interior created heritage initiatives focused on the history and historic places associated with Latinx, women, LGBTQ, and Asian American Pacific Islanders. There's this little to show you that. Um, those, in, those initiatives were meant to inspire us and to be truly inclusive in the work we do. Um, I do like the expansive idea. Um, but to continue, they had to stop being initiatives and just to become ongoing work. So we created Telling All Americans Stories as a national level history telling program. Our office's work is nearly wholly online, so Telling All American Stories is an extensive digital resource with content about historic places and the ordinary people who made history in them. We feature education materials for K through 12, informal learning materials, 
such as that discussion guide, the pride guide that Megan mentioned as a way to get the LGBTQ theme study into communities. And when we launched this in 2016, we added more to the who we are section and we included African Americans, European Americans and indigenous people. Uh, and soon after the site launched, I mean, sort of like within two weeks, we got public feedback with requests to add disability history. Uh, so the stars aligned and now we have a really pretty good feature which could serve as the basis for a formal theme study where our partners on the preservation side inclined to do that, which I think would be cool. Um, so telling all American stories features many who we are identities, right? We recognize the importance of representation. We also represent, uh, recognize the importance of bridging across groups through mutual experience and empathy. Uh, so we feature these stories of struggles and triumphs that connect histories through unifying themes. Uh, you see the little drop down there in the middle, migration and immigration, engaging with the environment, developing the American economy, and shaping the political landscape. And in that uh, latter theme of shaping the political landscape fits that really complex struggle for voting rights. Uh, we explore it in depth in the context of the 19th Amendment um, for the centennial commemoration that just happened last year. And I want to give a big shout out to Megan Springate, who served as the NPS National Coordinator for the centennial, and who is really responsible for the collaboration that made it a success. Um, and over the past three years, and it takes a long time to do a commemoration, right? We've leveraged the 19th Amendment centennial for national voting rights for women to center the stories of women. Um, so there's a lot online now in the Park Service um, about women's history on nps.gov. And it is a, it's a wonderful thing. <laughs> really delighted that that came, came to pass. We, did, we continue to do it. Um, but I do want to move away from digital history for a few minutes and just share some of what the Park Service is doing to support inclusive preservation. Uh, and it's clear from uh, my colleagues' presentations that telling all American stories is not just about stories, right? It's about preservation and stewardship of real places. But I will come back to the storytelling. So the National Historic Landmark Program continues to do their work, right? I just want to give you a couple of examples that they just gave me to share with you all. Uh, NHL staff has been working with the 1882 Foundation for nearly three years. Um, their original goal was to nominate the summit tunnels in China Wall in California, but the Union Pacific Railroad uh, blocked that nomination because the tunnels and walls are on the railroad's property and they don't want a, a designation. So the preservation attention has turned to associated nationally significant archeological sites in the Tahoe National Forest, the Summit Camp Archeological District, uh, which was a primary railroad worker camp with, it's just a phenomenal site. Uh, and then on another Asian American project, NHL staff are working with a Korean American group on a nomination of a site in California as well. So NHL work can be slow, but it takes a lot of work and it is persistent. So I want to say that my colleagues in the NHL program are, are persistent and doing good work. We also, I want to, this is a big shout out to Stephanie, um, who mentioned the underrepresented community grant program that would not exist without Stephanie's work as associate director. So kudos to you, Stephanie, for, for making that happen. Because documentation makes money, takes money. Uh, so <laughs> it takes a lot of money. The NPS State Tribal Local Plans and Grants Program includes grants for documenting and nominating places associated with underrepresented groups, right? Um, this was established in 2014 and it's funded by the Historic Preservation Fund. Back to this idea, it's like it's not taxpayer dollars. It's actually not tax supported. Um, the purpose of the fund is to uh, diversify nominations to the register. So I want to thank my colleagues in the register program for providing the data. <laughs> so it's a lot of data behind just these numbers. Uh, they supplied a lot more than I can share today. And so I'm hoping we can feature some of the results online. 
So far, there are over 50 successful National Register products, as you can see listed here, and that's just since the grant program started in, four, in 14. So I'm just going to share just a couple of examples, really just a few, just a, a taste. Uh, the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco is part of a larger effort to nominate places associated with Latinos in 20th century California that has so far documented eight properties in that project. This is just one of them. Uh, the Japanese uh, YWCA, which Megan mentioned, is in the Japan neighborhood, Japantown neighborhood. That's um, part of the San Francisco Civil Rights Project to document places. In Washington State, the Squamish Indian Tribe documented traditional cultural properties in the Port Medicine Reservation Project. Washington, D.C. wrote a historic context statement for the city's LGBTQ resources. A slow burl house is, was the home of uh, noted educated Lucy Diggs Slow and her, um, her partner, fellow educator and writing, writer Mary Burl. And in Wisconsin, the African American Heritage in Milwaukee project documented several properties, including the Lloyd A. Barbie House, which is home to the most important 20th century civil, civil rights leader in Wisconsin. So back to storytelling, right? Our, our preservation partners um, are, are very important for the work that we do. And the most recent National Trust for Historic Preservation Past Forward Conference in October was online, of course it was, but there was a real silver lining to that all digital meeting for me. And that was that I was able to hear all of the affinity group discussions um, by underrepresented communities. So I didn't have to just choose one or at most two. In person, I would have had to do that. So this was a really, it was a good day, a good online Zoom day. And what I heard was the critical importance of the telling of all American stories. So beyond the importance of tangible preservation of historic places, were really passionate calls, really passionate calls for interpretation and education. And I wanna share just a little bit of what I heard there that inspired and motivated me, right? Just little, these little tidbits. In the Native American discussion, the importance of teaching all students about indigenous history, that was raised up. In the Latinx conversation, how essential interpretation is. In the LGBTQ dialogue, particularly moving, education and interpretation essential so that people who are traditionally isolated and shamed can break that isolation by naming and claiming their history. Uh, it's not an extra, it saves lives. And in the African American session, teaching as essential as historic preservation shifts to becoming a tool for social justice. Redefining, and I wrote this, I think I got the quote right, um, and I think it was Brent Legs, but I'm not sure, so I'm not going to say definitively. Redefining a new American heritage and culture will go nowhere without interpretation and education. So for each of these groups, from every group, the message is really clear. Historic preservation cannot stop at preservation of physical properties, but has to include the story. It seems so obvious and it often gets shortchanged. And I sometimes have to remind the Park Service why it matters. So I wanna share um, this quote with you. Our preservation conversations um, bring, uh, that we've been having for decades, right? bring to mind for me social science discussions about social capital. And I like the work that John Powell and his colleagues do at the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley. So I think this is a relevant thought for historic preservation in this project of resetting the margins. We believe that the only viable solution to the problem of othering is one involving inclusion and belongingness. 
The most important good we distribute to each other in society is membership. So none of the discussions I heard in the past forward sessions were about segregated learning, right? They may be about local places and local history, but they're not small histories of small places. They're not about my history for me and your history for you. They're conversations about belonging. They're about preserving tangible places so that yes, individual places can be experienced as real places in the real world, but also so that each of the local stories has a home in the national story, a complicated, multifaceted, pluralistic, integrated national story. This is the rest of their thought. Belongingness entails an unwavering commitment to not simply tolerating and respecting difference, but to ensuring that all people are welcome and feel that they belong in a society. So preservation means nothing if people don't care, right? If I don't see myself in the nation's history, then I don't feel like I belong. And I certainly don't care about places or objects that have nothing to do with me. And if I don't see you in the nation's history, then I don't feel like you belong. And I have no reason to care about the places and objects vital to your sense of belonging. So the storytelling matters a lot. And without it, the preservation is temporary. So I want to close with a question that is about preservation, but beyond preservation. And it's a question that personally motivates me. And it's maybe that something preservation can help the nation address. We're in a space and a time where we need to address this question. How do we ensure each other's belonging? Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Barbara. Um, I have a few questions. That, uh, this is a Q, the Q&A section and I've got your question noted as one for the panelists. So if all of the panelists would rejoin us, um, I think some of you are, I'll share the three questions that have come up and also if we have time post. Um, the one easy one, which um, is for Franklin, is uh, from Allison Jefferson and she supports my request that we hope you are writing your memoirs. So can you fill us in a little bit? I'm sorry? Uh, uh, can you uh, tell us whether you're writing your memoirs? Uh, not yet, but I, 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 I will be so advised. <laughs> okay, well, today's a good day to start. We've got okay. you uh, recorded. We have a second question from Marilyn White, and I do want to clarify this one. Should some of these programs be taxpayer supported? Actually, the majority of the work that you heard were taxpayer supported, um, but because of uh, the issues that we do have with funding, both for the internal park service programs and the and the uh, partnership programs, we did go outside of taxpayer funding to look for additional help, which is where the Gill Foundation grant came from. The Historic Preservation Fund is a different um, source of funding. The, it is based on a portion of the revenues that come in from offshore drilling, and it's set aside to provide historic preservation support. It is authorized at 150 million. It has never reached that in recent years. It's getting close, but it supports a number of our partners in the work that they do um, for, um, you know, documenting our collective history. So that actually is federal money, but it's not taxpayer money. It's revenues from um, people seeking their permits for offshore drilling. The last question that in is from Brian Crane asking about, uh, in short, the status of the American labor history and HL theme study. Um, and he does recognize that there was one drafted, but it was very inadequate um, in many ways. And my understanding is the landmark program has been working on it, um, 
I don't know the status. There's, there's been a draft, um, a revised new draft for four years. So maybe yeah. we'll see it at some point soon. I think that uh, <laughs> that along with the draft new guidance for the NHL <laughs> um, program may see the light of day now. <laughs> uh, with the change of administrations, and I particularly hope so for the NHL guidance. Um, but yeah, I think that may be a factor of not putting something that might be controversial or difficult out in the previous administration. So that may be an unwarranted political assumption, but I, it definitely may be time for those to come out. So, um, uh, in terms of how do we ensure each other's belonging, um, do any of you want to kind of weigh in on Barbara's question? Franklin. Well, first I'd, I'd say this kind of work needs um, advocacy, support, participation, and it's certainly worth uh, taxpayer investment. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Um, anyone else, Megan? Sure. Um, when I came out of the closet in 1987, uh, my my sort of there there was no positive role model, right? My options were to be a predator, um, to kill myself, or to be a victim, right? Of of mm -hmm. said predators. Um, and. How do we all make sure we're all included? I think representation is absolutely critical, right? We create who we are in a conversation with the world that is around us, right? Um, I'm putting on my anthropology hat. Um, we, we cannot create a sense of who we are just with no, no form of reference, right? And to be invisible, which is what happens when you don't have a history or you don't have representation is brutal. It's really hard. And it's, it's part of why the suicide rate for LGBTQ folks is at least, you know, three times 30%, right? Which is three times higher than, than the average. Um, because we don't know how to be, we don't, history we don't have it's it's changing um but representation in history in preservation um you know in advertising on tv pop culture you know is absolutely critical um because it is the it is the only way that we can create a sense of who we are as individuals and as communities i have to say i gave very short mention of the power of acknowledgement, which the Kellogg grant gave us the opportunity to explore. My own experience in witnessing the development of these theme studies, and before that, um, working with the Cesar Chavez Foundation um, to document 40 acres in La Paz, the dedication of 40 acres was probably one of the most memorable experiences of my life with the excitement, the pride um, was, was just breathtaking. And the dedication of Stonewall, speaking to what you just were talking about, Megan, where uh, Director Jarvis mentioned, um, I don't believe in his speech, but afterwards, that he had received a text from a young gay guy who basically said that the recognition that that represented had saved his life, at least for the next, for that day. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the tears, the excitement, the jockeying to make sure that their story was part of it, particularly in LGBT, which was overwhelming, what was just, um, so powerful and some of the um, parks who really took that on as a mission, not just uh, down in Mississippi, um, 
their their park actually worked with the local high school to research a an incident in which 40 uh, African American citizens of the community were imprisoned in horrible conditions 40 years before and actually took that story, ran with it and presented it to the city council. And mm -hmm. it resulted in a long overdue apology to mm -hmm. the community. So I think that um, certainly my, one of my takeaways is that you can't underestimate as Megan so powerfully stated, how important that acknowledgement is um, as we face such terrible division in the country in terms of what that, that might mean and recognizing we're all part of this larger society. Anybody else want to weigh in on Barbara's question? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. I mean, I, you know, Barbara, you put that so beautifully. And I think one of your, and you know, one of the things that I think is so important to say is that, you know, NPS and the NHL program in particular have worked best when they're working on this question very actively of belonging, right? And I think that's something that, you know, you know, obviously you've taken a major leadership role on this as, as did Stephanie during her time and Megan and Franklin and, and many others. You know, I, I think that we do have to recognize that, however, that, you know, the demands for belonging most often don't emerge from organizations like NPS, right? They're actually responses mm -hmm. by, in this case, by NPS to demands that are coming from elsewhere. And so, you know, what occurs to me to say is that, you know, um, as we think about NPS's role vis-a-vis -vis belonging, um, you know, I think a couple things, you know, first of all, a, a willingness to riff, to continue to refine practices, to be more belonging, to, you know, to kind of riff on something Anthea said yesterday, to mm -hmm. recognize ourselves as individuals, but also our institutions and organizations as always becoming, right? Always needing to recognize the change that's, that's, that's happening and, and more change that's needed. So working on and committing to ongoing refinement of practice, you know, the integrity rule is one example of that. I think that, you know, in as, as, as others know and have, have said more powerfully than I can, you know, has functioned um, to work against belonging, even if it wasn't necessarily intended um, to function in that way. It's been an obstacle. So that's one thing, certainly. You know, I think another thing is the kind of commitment to collaborative work that really does um, you know, empower and embolden and, um, you know, give dignity to voices and perspectives outside of, you know, those in power. And I think one of the things that's just so um, impressive and inspiring, for example, Megan, about your work with, with your theme study is the way that you really manage to do that, to give authorship and voice and clarity and authority um, to um, individuals and organizations and perspectives, it, multiple ones, sometimes conflicting ones out there that might not have, have had that um, authority in, in, in this work of collaboration. You know, and then the third thing that occurs to me to say is, you know, um, commitment to expertise, <laughs> which is sometimes mm -hmm. run against kind of community-based um, work, not always, doesn't have to, but, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things, of course, that's just generally frustrating about, you know, recent years in Washington, D.C. is a kind of turning away <laughs> against expertise, as we all know. We think about this more often, mm -hmm. maybe in the sciences than we do in some other areas, but you know, I think NPS does well when it, um, you know, when it does recognize uh, the expertise that it has and the expertise that it doesn't have, that it needs to go out and find, you know, other places. And so, you know, again, Stephanie, just kudos and props to you that I think one of the things that you did is, you know, assure that, you know, for example, our NHL committee had broad representation and expertise, um, you know, with a member of a tribal nation who was a you know, a, you know, an expert in archaeology, for example, and we had um, expertise in Latinx and African American studies and LGBTQ studies and, and other and other areas that I'd like to think was helpful in this movement towards belonging, right, and pushing um, collaboratively, but sometimes pushing NPS to do more. The last last thing I want to say though is that all of this does. Um, as happy and as it sounds, you know, I think there are challenges to this that we need to take seriously. It's not all gonna work. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the major challenges I think may, we may wanna think about may come from native communities who may not think about this, these questions of belonging in quite the same ways as, you know, I've been talking about them here and that maybe the spirit of this conversation is. 
who might instead think about authority and sovereignty in ways that may, you know, run up against um, mm -hmm. and a very well-intentioned effort by NPS and others to bring into the story and make more visible, um, uh, you know, local histories, place-based histories, um, preservationist efforts that actually may not be um, seen by members of those communities, leadership in those communities as being what they seek and how they imagine belonging, for example. So I think we have to think carefully also about those kinds of challenges and, you know, ones coming from tribal communities come first to mind, but I'm sure that's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. Let's see, I think we have one more question. Um, no, I guess not. I see four, but I'm not seeing four questions. So um, we have just a couple minutes left. Um, I, I certainly have other thoughts, but are there anything, anything that you wanted to say that um, time compression, this is your time. If there's one last thought um, that you want to share. Well, I'll kick it off and just say that um, I don't think that I think one of the most important things for that uh, we really haven't touched on is empowerment in terms of what listing does, even though it's procedural, in terms of giving people a voice at the table, at least in terms of federal actions through the 106 process. And it's um, that, that empowerment, not only through acknowledgement and recognition, but literally on the ground, I can be here because this is my resource and you have to listen to me. How important is that um, in, in something that we need to talk about more? Well, that was a <laughs> by other facts. Um, so I I hear I hear I hear your I mean I think that's a good point about empowerment. Um, my last thought will be actually um, Donna Graves put a question in the chat. So oh okay um, I see that. How, how in how can in I'll read the whole thing. Um, well, no, I, I won't. Um, how can NPS help support interpretation is a critical fundamental piece of our work to ensure that all American stories are told and, and heard. Um, I actually also, and that's actually partly a collaboration and empowerment answer um, because we can't do it, in fact, if, if we're not asked to do it. So don't rely on our leadership to ask us and the asking to come from above like rain. Um, be a community who says to the park service, hey, what about us, right? It's um, government by and for the people. So let's, let's do that. Well, don't tell anyone, Barbara, but I certainly stretched the recommendations in the civil rights study to give me the <laughs> mandate to, to, to move forward with that. So there's a little bit more wiggle room there, but I, I do think that um, the work that you've been doing through the Telling All Americans um, websites are providing a lot of information for people to run with in terms of developing their own interpretation programs. Um, and I also want to acknowledge Donna, who, whose work with Gail Dubrow on Japanese American Place was mm. provided a context for us to be able to nominate, for example, the Panama Hotel in Seattle, even before we had the theme study. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are other ways to develop that context. And Donna and Gail's works are examples of that. Anyone yeah. else? There, yeah. uh, Don, I just want to shout out to Donna uh, and Gail also for their uh, work in LGBTQ, uh, recognizing yes. LGBTQ history and heritage. So. And um, in Donna's case for Rosie the Riveter. So um, thank you, one of, um, another major contributor. Final, final call and we'll wrap it up. Okay, thank you all. Um, for me, it's been such a pleasure to, to be in the room with all of you again. <laughs> um, it was a very rewarding time and one that it's also very rewarding to see how
we have served as kind of a priming the pump, which was all mm -hmm. always part of my vision and how the activities of so many groups have really exploded with that priming. So thank you all. And um, we miss you, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm still hanging in there a little bit. <laughs> well, well, the, so, well, before, yeah. before, before I let you all off the hook, at least since we have a little bit of time, um, mm. I wanted to actually pose this question um, for all of you as we now enter into this new administration, right? And I think I mentioned to Barbara earlier this week or recently, um, you know, how can we move forward in this new administration? We all know that the Department of the Interior, it is basically empty right now since no one can really go in. <laughs> but, you know, it was also empty in the last few four years um, in, in many ways. And I know that the, the leadership will need to now, you know, uh, bring back things like the National Park Advisory Board, the NHL Landmarks Committee, right? Um, and, and other key moments of partnership and, um, you know, expertise from the ground. And so what advice would you give? This is being recorded <laughs> and, you know, um, and that it's going to be uploaded on YouTube. So, and we have over almost 900 people who are registered to, to attend the symposium. So this is a moment to really capture how can we best support and advocate for this work to continue in this administration and you know fingers crossed that um congresswoman deb holland's nomination she gets confirmed soon and i know there may be restrictions on those who are currently employed with the national park service right now so <laughs> i'm just gonna mute my mic okay <laughs> those not currently working in the national park service um what advice would you give to those as we move forward I mean, looking at these key partnerships and being more equitable in telling our stories. Well, Go ahead. can I start? Um, old fashioned lobbying, uh, your congressional representatives, I think um, those of us who have not historically uh, or routinely been engaged with um, uh, seeking support from our representatives should should do this more in uh, regular fashion. I think that that will make a big difference. Well, we can all just listen to Franklin Odo. That's always a good idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it just it occurs to me to say you know two broad things. Number one, you know, I think many of the issues that we've had. Um, as a country in the recent past, of course, they're older and it's well-established issues, we know that, but they're also a more contemporary crisis of culture, um, uh, by which I mean, you know, a failure to tell stories accurately, a failure to represent people accurately, a failure to allow people to represent themselves um, in key corners of this world. Um, and I think that NPS can play a really important role in um, doing the work, the cultural work but I think we're all um, all the more impressed now than even we were four years ago it needs to be done, right? To um, represent all American stories, to use that important tagline, to go deep into our histories, to find ways to make connections between histories, to think intersectionally um, and so much more. So there's, I think, an important kind of cultural commitment that I hope um, people at all levels of leadership in this country, from the local to the national, will make to do this kind of cultural agenda that I think needs to be invested in um, and, and paid attention to that, that I think is critical for, for all of us in the years ahead. And as I think, you know, the second thing is as we do that, I think it's going to be about um, looking at best practices of the past um, that have, have, have made headway um, in the past but also um, new ideas that haven't yet been tried out, funded, engaged, right? And so I think that there are, you know, and some of them came up in this conversation, there are many good things that NPS um, has done in the past, but I hope will be re-engaged uh, energetically, funded again, um, uh, and so forth, you know? But then there's also gonna have to be experimentation, right? That's guided by principle and commitment, 
um, that's 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 organized and led by by people with um, you know expertise and ideas and openness. Um, openness to ideas, but also openness to feedback and criticism. And so those are the two things that occur to me to say, you know, when we think about this, you know, the future, I'm quite hopeful in many ways about the future. We've gone through a, a difficult and challenging time. And so I think it's now our turn to have, um, you know, reasons to be hopeful and, and reasons to think positively about what's, what's about to come for NPS and, and for many other um, areas of government. Yeah, I, I want to follow up Go ahead. Quick. If, if that, yeah, on, on what Steve said, um, there is such a responsibility, right, as representatives of the federal government in sharing these histories and, and having these conversations and telling these stories, but that responsibility is, is heightened even more by the love that people have for the Park Service, right? When the Park Service does something, there is a, a real weight behind that. Um, and, and so I just want to say that there is that, that responsibility, like people take notice of what the Park Service does, but they also take notice of what the Park Service chooses not to do. And I hope that people keep that in the forefront of their mind uh, moving forward. I, I very much agree with you, and that's all part of that um, thinking about acknowledgement, the, the recognition by the National Park Service, even for groups who weren't that keyed into it, as it progressed, really seemed to matter. And so that's an important asset that we, we need to, to um, make sure that we don't betray. I, I would say to you, um, Michelle, is to wait and see who the new leadership is, what the White House might want to initiate in terms of addressing some of these issues, and be prepared with your elevator speech. I mean, that sounds trite, but when I went in to talk to the Associate Director about the AAPI study, which she wanted to have done, I took that opportunity to say we can do the theme study but if it's going to have to be impact we need to find more funding for people to actually do the work and she said how much do you need and I quoted a sum and she said you've got it um, of course the people in the budget office went berserk but we did get uh, some money that started the funding so that's the other thing is be prepared to make your case um, so when the opportunity provides, you can get right in there. So thanks everybody. Um, I, th I think we, yeah, we're hopefully looking towards some exciting times, but uh, everybody needs to kind of look around and say, wow, it's already exciting in terms of how much is happening. So thanks very much for the opportunity to be with you all. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle, for organizing. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> right. And I want to just close in this session with, as Stephanie said, have your elevator pitch. Because when the moment I met Stephanie, I didn't know who she was and what her title was, that she just had the Park Service uniform on. And I kind of attacked her and said about um, Cesar Chavez National Monument. I said, I will not sleep until the stories of Filipino American you know, le uh, leaders in the movement are recognized. And Stephanie, and in, in, this was very telling of the National Park Service, I really believe. Stephanie looked at me and she could have ran away, you know, from me. But then she goes, yes, I will work with you. How can we work together? And so I, that, you know, is just a closing of this session of like, how can we work together to mm -hmm. rectify the past wrongs or the shortcomings that we all face in, in, this, in this movement together. So I thank everyone again for being part of this wonderful session.